In this video, we'll discuss an overview of functions. Now, a function is a relation between two sets in which each element in the domain maps to exactly one element in the range. We verify this in tables by looking at our inputs and comparing that to make sure that they have exactly one output. In a graph, we're looking at the vertical line test. And often those sets that we look at in tables, we could graph and also use the vertical line test on them as well. So let's look at some examples. Here's a set with three ordered pairs. Each x value goes to exactly one y value. So yes, this is a function. Now compare that in this set, we have an x value of five that's being used for two different y values. That's not allowed with functions, so no, this is not a function. Now here, this sometimes will throw people because they all share the same y value. But it's not about the output, it's about the input. And each input, negative 4, 2, and negative 20, go to exactly one output. So this is a function. And if you graph them, you would have them aligning horizontally so they would pass the vertical line test to as a graph. Now say we want to graph y equals x squared minus 4. Easiest thing to do, graph it. And then we're going to take our vertical line test and see does it intersect the line at exactly one location across the entire graph. So I run that line across and I say yes, it does. Therefore, this is a function. Contrast that with this horizontal parabola. As I run my vertical line across, I start to hit at two places for every x value, which goes against being a function. So because those locations are hitting it with two values for x, it is not a function. With functions, we also deal with the domain and range. The domain being all the values for which the function is defined, and the range being all the values for which the function takes on as an output. When we try to determine them, first thing, sets are the easiest because our domain is typically our x value in an ordered pair, and our range is the output or those y values. We write them together in brackets to represent the domain and range. Equations and graphs, we're going to focus primarily on the domain. When we're looking for the domain, we would start with negative infinity to infinity and start to determine what can we remove from this for which the graph does not include the domain. So I look for things like having a denominator that has a variable. If so, I need to set that equal to zero because any value that satisfies that will not be allowed in the domain. If I have an even index radical, just the evens, that has to be greater than or equal to zero because if I have a, if my number becomes negative inside the radical, then I end up with a complex number or an imaginary number, which can't be graphed on the real coordinate plane. And then if I graphed it, those will look like holes, asymptotes, or even a stop in the graph in one direction or another. In that domain, we often will write in interval notation. So we'll look at some examples to help us with that. Let's start with just a set. When I look at my set and want to determine the domain, it's going to be my x values. So in this case, that's 2, 3, and 4 with the brackets. When I'm talking about my range, that's 5, 7, and 9. And that's all it's to when it's a set. Nice and easy. Now, when we get a graph, say we go back to that function y equals x squared minus 4, my domain, I want to start and say, are there any roots that I have to deal with? No. Is there a denominator? No. So there's nothing restricting the domain in this case. So it is from negative infinity to positive infinity. And we use parentheses again because we can never touch infinity. Now, if we want to look at the range, the easiest thing to do is to graph it for what we're going to do. And we want to look going from bottom to top and say, is there a place that the range stops or starts in either direction? Here, I'm going to start at the very bottom. I see it curves to this vertex, which hits right at negative 4. And as I look upward, the graph goes on forever. Like you would draw little arrows there if you're drawing it personally. And so that means that every value from negative 4 up will be true for the range. In notation, that gets a bracket because negative 4 is included. And you could plug it in to your equation here to verify. And then all the positive infinity. Now, say we get something more complex. And say in this case, 
we're not going to worry with the range. We're going to focus on the domain. And if I do this, first thing, I do have a square root. That's an even index. I know that has to be at least 0. So what I'm going to do is take the 2x minus 4 and make it greater than or equal to 0. Write it as an inequality. I solve this. I add 4 to both sides. Divide by 2. So I know that the only thing so far the domain can be is greater than or equal to 2. That's first thing. Then I look and say, is there a denominator? Well, yes, there is. That denominator cannot equal 0. So I'm going to take x minus 10 and set it so it's not equal to 0. I add 10 to both sides. So that means also, not only does it have to be greater than or equal to 2, it cannot equal 10. So how do I write that in interval notation? Let's start as the lowest number we can go to is 2. And it's equals 2, so I can put a bracket. Now I say, OK, if I think about greater than or equal to 2 means it goes on to infinity. But I hit a snag. That snag is 10. So I'm going to put 10 here with the parentheses because I cannot equal. Then I'm going to use the union symbol. And I'm going to start back at 10 and go on to infinity in this case because this told me I have to go all the way through infinity to make this true. So that not equal causes this little part where I have to write the union to represent that 10 cannot be included with that domain. If you graph this, this is what the graph would look like. And you can see it starts at 2, it hits an asymptote at 10, and then after 10 it just goes on infinitely. Now on top of that, we can also do operations with functions. We just have to pay attention to the order in which they're written. So when I say f plus g of x, that means I'm going to take the first function and add it to the second function. Same thing with the other three operations. So nothing here is beyond what we've done before with operations. Just pay attention to the order of the function. So if we have that d of x equals 3x plus 2, and k of x equals 12x minus 8, I now want to solve d, I'm sorry, k minus d of x. So they're telling me to take the k function and subtract the d function. That's how I can write it to help me out. Now I'll say, okay, k function, 12x minus 8. d function is the 3x plus 2. Now I'm going to simplify my expression. First thing, distribute that negative to both those terms. Now I have 12x minus 8 minus 3x minus 2. I combine like terms, and this should give me 9x minus 10, because 12x minus 3x, 9x, negative 8 minus 2 is minus 10. Last thing I'll talk about is the composition of functions. This uses an open dot versus if it's a solid dot, that means multiplication. The open dot means that that is a composition of functions. And what that's saying is I'm going to take the second function listed and input it as the x value for the first function listed. So this is f of g of x. That's how you would say it. So say I had h of x equals 3x plus 2, p of x equals 12x minus 8. And I want to do p of h of x. That means I'm going to take my h of x expression and substitute it in for my x's in my p of x. So I'm looking at 3x plus 2 being substituted in for x. So I've got the 12. I'm going to take this whole expression, substitute in for x, and then remember that there's the minus 8. Now I want to simplify my expression by distributing the 12, which will give me 36x plus 24 minus 8. Simplify by doing the 24 minus 8, and this will give me that p of h of x will equal 36x plus 16.